His band has been cited by artists like Metallica and Megadeth as a major influence on their sound. Our guest this week is Brian Tatler of Diamond Head on the VVN Music Podcast. Hi and welcome to episode 41 of the VVN Music Podcast. I'm Roger Wink and this week we have Brian Tatler of the British heavy metal band Diamond Head. Tatler and Duncan Scott first started playing together in 1976 while still in high school, eventually forming Diamond Head. They released their first album, Lightning to the Nations, independently in 1980 along with their 1982 set, Borrowed Time, before being signed with MCA for the album Canterbury. It was also during this time that the band's early releases were heard by the members of groups like Metallica and Megadeth, who have talked openly of their admiration for the Diamond Head sound. In their early days, Metallica covered a number of Diamond Head songs during their sets, and just a couple weeks ago, Lars Ulrich announced he was starting a new radio show called It's Electric, named after the Diamond Head song and using the original recording for the theme music. The band has taken a couple of breaks over the years, but reformed in 2000 and have been going strong ever since. Their latest, self-titled album, was released last year, and they are touring this spring and summer in both the U.S. and Europe. I know you open your U.S. tour in less than a week. That's right, yeah, next Wednesday. You've, uh, you're returning, I guess you were here last, uh, last fall, correct? That's right, yeah, we did uh, November into December, we did about five weeks, so that was the longest tour we've ever done. How do you find the fans in the U.S. compared to those in Europe? Uh, I think it depends, really. Certain towns, you know, are better than others. Uh, Obviously, the big cities are going to be bigger than New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, but uh, the fans themselves, that they're all, you know, pretty pretty keen. You get some of the the guys who are, have got albums to sign and have kept them in mint condition for like thirty years, and uh, they've got patches of the band and all sorts of things like that. And uh, and you get a lot of people who have taken pictures and uh, and then they blow them up to like ten by eights or or whatever, and then get get you to sign those as well. Uh, so, you, you know, there's all kinds of uh, of uh, fans out there. Um, it's just always nice to meet somebody who's a fan of the band. I, I'd never tire of the novelty. <laughs> what, uh, what can fans expect from the show this time around? Uh, well, I mean, we have to play certain songs. So those songs, you know, which you could probably guess, uh, have to remain in the set or it would be a pretty weird Diamond Dead gig without certain songs. But we always try to put in something that we haven't done for a while. Uh, I've got a song lined up this time that we haven't done since 1982. Uh, so that's going in there. And, uh, well, of course, we're doing songs from the new album. I think there's about four songs from the new album in the set. Uh, uh, We've done probably about eight songs off the new album, and, and you know, we just swap them around occasionally. So uh, it, it's good to promote the new album. It's, it's nice for the band to have some new material to play as well. I understand that uh, you yesterday you had to cancel a couple shows. I think you're breaking this up into two legs now and another one in, I believe, August. Right. But you had to cancel right. a couple shows? That's what I hear, yeah. I think uh, Sacramento and possibly... Is it the Petaluma one? I, I, I just had an email today, so I, I've only just found out. Uh, but yeah, we're coming over for two weeks uh, in May, starting next Wednesday, and then we're back to the UK, and we've got we've got things in Europe, we've got festivals in uh, Norway, Holland, Germany, Spain, etc. Uh, and then we come back over to the the US in August into September. When you first started out. <laughs> it's, it's my understanding that it was while, first while you were still in high school, and second, you were yeah. doing it. Uh, I believe what I read was that you, know, you were playing on a, a fairly cheap guitar, and your drummer yeah. was playing on uh, Cracker Ten. That's right. All you know, very innocent. Uh, 
the band, like, like you pointed out, started at school, and um, I just pretty much auditioned a couple of friends to get, you know, to find a singer and uh, talked someone into playing the bass and things like that. But yeah, I, I had my brother's old guitar, which cost £14 back in, uh, you know, 1976. Uh, and then our drummer, Duncan, had, a, well, he didn't have a drum kit, so he made one out of biscuit tins and uh, a big plastic wine tub and uh, you know we made a symbol out of added something and uh, it was all pretty much do it yourself uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but we managed you know we, we start you started from scratch and learned how to write songs and we you know just beginners really as I say absolute beginners well I know, I know that area of England fairly well and and uh I know that just outside of Birmingham and so forth, that that's, that's very much a working class area. So that's not that surprising yeah. for a way to start. No, that's right. And I mean, you know, we didn't have the money to just go and buy a drum kit or something. A drum kit would have cost a couple of hundred pounds. And we, you know, when you're at school or just about, you know, just leaving school and trying to get a job, you, you can't afford to, to shell out on a drum kit or a, you know, an, an expensive amplifier. So it was kind of big steal and borrow. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's a working class uh, area, uh, around the Midlands. I, I mean, of course, Black Sabbath are from Birmingham and Judas Priest are from the Midlands. So I always kind of drew so, some kind of inspiration from that, that, that these guys started with, you know, very little and built this uh, career out of, um, you know, from from a Midlands band or a Birmingham band to uh, to go from scratch to see them playing across the world and thinking, hmm, you know, so it is possible. <laughs> it was in, it was inspirational to have local bands uh, in the style of music that I like uh, do so well. Your first show that you ever did was. Yeah. mainly originals which is amazing because so many bands yeah. start out doing almost straight covers for the first couple of years of their existence yeah that's right i think it's better to do your own material i think you you're going to end up more original and to be honest we weren't very good musicians in the early days so there wasn't much opportunity to just play covers and do gigs like that because we were just starting out from scratch learning how to play as we went along and, and the, the early songs we wrote were very simple almost like you know heavy metal dirges uh, and and our um, our skill as writers progressed as we as we wrote more and more and, and recorded ourselves on on uh, my cassette recorder. But we did try and do a couple of covers, but we couldn't really play them very well. And uh, we we give up on them. You know, we do it once or twice live. We did Paranoid, and we did uh, I think we did Space Station Number Five once or twice. But uh, yeah, all we wanted to do really was was write something great. I think write write an an epic, you know, write a brilliant song like like the sort of bands we listened to. And and you know, when you'd go and see a band like Sabbath or Priest, you know, ACDC, they weren't playing covers. So I just thought the way forward is is write your own songs and and just get good. Yeah, you establish your own style and, and reputation yeah. that way. Yep. And, and and probably more original than than you just you know steal from uh, this song and that song. Uh, I mean, it's worked for some bands, but uh, it never really interested uh, Diamond Head. You issued your first album independently, and I guess we're independent for at least the first three or four years of your career. Was that mm. something that you uh, made a conscious decision to do? No, uh, it was just a case of. We were struggling to get a record deal, and uh, we we got an album recorded in a week, recorded and mixed. And uh, the the manager we had at the time said, like, instead of okay, if if, if we can't get a record deal for it, then uh, we'll release it ourselves. So it was the time of punk rock and all that. You know that had happened uh, in the UK. It was huge. So bands were. were making their own records and there were indie labels and all that so uh, we got a thousand records pressed and we, we'd sell them at gigs and we sold the mail order 
And we, we did shift a thousand copies quite quickly, which was, of course, uh, the White Album or Lightning to the Nations. And um, we printed up another thousand and sold them. Uh, but it did take us a long time to get a deal, and it was a very frustrating period for myself and the band. It seemed to, you know, all other bands got signed, like, uh, you know, we'd read this uh, low, um, was a, a music paper called Sounds. Uh, that was about all there was that would feature things like uh, New Wave of British Heavy Metal, and uh, bands like Girl School and High Maiden and. Samson and Saxon and you name it, they all seemed to get signed uh, and we we couldn't and you know I mean in hindsight it could have been management, it could have been this could have been that, it could have been we were asking too much, I'm not really sure but uh, it did take us a while we didn't sign on the dotted line until 1982 an, an awful lot of artists cite Diamond Head as, as a major influence and, and of course the best known is probably Metallica, but obviously yeah, they, <laughs> they they uh, they they got your music somehow because they had to have heard it during that independent phase of your career. Yeah, well, it's a case of Lars heard uh, it's Electric first on it, which, which was on a MCA sampler called Brute Force, like just a, a new wave of British heavy metal compilation album, and then because we were advertising our uh, debut album in sounds as a side mail order. Uh, Lars simply sent for a copy. Um, he'd be living in I. He'd probably have got sounds ordered through his news agent. Then he would uh, he ordered a copy of the album, uh, and you know. I mean, we'd probably even think, oh, somebody in America has bought the album, you know, because <laughs> uh, we were all doing it ourselves and posting them out, and uh, we were fully aware of, you know, how many we'd sold and things like that. So Lars would have got his copy and mail order and obviously liked it. And uh, and then a little bit later, of course, Metallica start um, covering Diamond Head songs and, and in their early set lists. It was mainly covers, so they'd do three or four or even five Diamond Head songs in a in a set, and 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 they of course gradually worked their own material into their live act, didn't they? You signed with MCA, I think, in in 1982, and. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, they tried to commercialize your sound a little bit, and I'm just curious whether signing with a label like that was a good thing or a bad thing, at least from your creative side. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, I, I mean, we were we needed to get signed because the band, you know, just probably couldn't continue forever the, the way it was going. Um, so we needed to get signed, but yeah, obviously, record labels want you to have a record that they can play on the radio. So we were kind of encouraged to write a hit single, which so we wrote "Call Me." Uh, but I do think uh, our singer Sean Harris was kind of into the idea of of having a hit record, and you know, being a being a bit more commercial, I don't think he was what he was banging the drum to get heavier, faster, darker. So, you know, ultimately, that's more the direction Sean, I think, wanted to go anyway. But uh, at the time, I mean, we were just uh, we were just taking it as it came, you know, dealing with with um, things as they came, and uh, it, it, it was very, you know, I, I think we were a bit naive. Um, we were only a young band. Uh, we didn't know all the answers. We hadn't got professional management advising us. So we probably made mistakes like a lot of bands do. It, 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 it's, it's fortunate that we've survived the, the ups and downs, really, and we're still going now after 40 years because a lot of bands threw in the towel in the 80s. There was hundreds of new wave of British heavy metal bands, and most of them gave up didn't they they might do a single or you know do some local shows and stuff and then they just seem to disappear back to their day jobs i imagine that there was a 
good part of it in that while well, you would have advances for recording and and have them doing a lot of your publicity and things but i can yeah. see where it would be it would be tough to get around the corporate machine after being independent yes. And, of course, once you're in debt to them, once they've paid for the album and the producer and the, the tour and the, the lighting and, you know, uh, you're in debt to them. And then they have more, even more power over you because you need help to get out of this hole and start making a living, really. A lot of bands end up massively in debt. And and you either, you know, suddenly have the big album like Def Leppard with Pyromania, for example, or you get dropped, and Diamond Head got dropped. We were dropped after two years with MCA. We made two albums, and we were dropped after two years. And then it's just sink or swim, isn't it? It's it's a it's a cruel world. <laughs> yep, it is. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. a different world today too, because there are an yeah. awful lot more people that are are going the independent route and actually doing well because they can make a name for themselves live and and so forth. Yeah, so. yeah, that's right. There's more media platforms now, isn't there, for exposure? Yeah, there is. But there's also an awful lot more bands out there trying to do yeah. it, so the competition's that's, harder. That's right. It almost still becomes a level playing field. <laughs> Back, but you know, like you said, there's more of everything. But you've still got to make it make become successful. It it it's, uh, it, it does get hard. It's it's probably always been hard. You've just got to have the staying power. You've taken two breaks as a band. Uh, yeah. The first one was in the late '80s, and it, it, uh, you took five years off. What did you do during that five-year period? I worked in a studio. I became a kind of house engineer, producer, and I uh, had, I formed a band called Radio Moscow while I was in the studio, and I had access to musicians and you know recording free downtime and record uh, rehearsal space. Uh, and uh, eventually, um, you know, Diamond Head got back together. Uh, Radio Moscow couldn't get a record deal, and uh, and then I was offered a publishing deal, and uh, it kind of it kind of all fell back into place, and we we uh, we put the band back together, really, you know, as as the cliche goes. <laughs> It was the second time around, though, was fairly short lived. What was yeah. the reason for that? Um, I think it was because uh, Sean didn't want it to to go on too long, really. As from what I can gather, uh, Diamond Head was just an, another album. Like he'd already done this album with with Robin George called Notorious. Uh, he'd had these advance. He'd had his. Uh, publishing advance and record advance. And then Robin w was off doing an album with somebody else, so he'd get his second advance. And, and uh, so Sean was put back together with me in order to do another Diamond album so that Sean could get his next advance because it would be uh, part of his uh, contract. But I don't think it was kind of going to be an ongoing thing. I think it was just uh, a bit like a project, really. So he, he, he did... Uh, he did what was necessary to get it made, and then he and then started talking about the next project. You know, while we were recording the album that became Death and Progress, Sean was already looking forward to doing the next uh, project that didn't involve me, uh, where he, he was planning to sign with uh, RCA with another another set of musicians, but um, it didn't. That didn't happen ultimately, and. Uh, so the band stopped again in uh, 1990, well, 1994, really, it stopped again, because we did a, we completed a live album, and uh, and then that was it, really. And also, there was a couple of meetings where Sean wanted his mom to manage Diamond Head, and I wasn't into that idea, and things didn't seem to move forward, really. Difficult time. She had Sorry. been one of the original... Uh managers correct yeah that's right well it's his mom he's you know he wants he wants his mom involved and i i don't really and that was that was the last time that sean played with diamond head was it up to the end of that uh second no. go around wasn't it uh no because we reformed again in 2000 and we did we did a couple of years where we did some an acoustic ep and we did some about 10 gigs as an acoustic 
just myself, Sean, and this guy called Floyd. Then we, we, got, we got off at a festival in New York called Metal Meltdown. So we went and did that, and then we did more gigs on the back of that as we, we've now recruited a drummer and bass player, a new drummer and bass player. And um, we, let me think, so... Yeah, so we did a few more gigs around that, and then we went into the studio to to make another album, but that album never got released. So, so complicated and <laughs> frustrating for me. You are, though, in the midst of what is basically the longest iteration of the band. It's going on 17 yeah. years. And, That's uh, right. You know, of the five current members, three of them are relatively new. They've come along, I think, in, within the last seven, eight years. I assume that you've fallen into a, a pretty comfortable situation and everybody is, 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 is working out well for the band. Yes, yeah. It's, it's, it's better than it has been for a long time because everybody's very positive and we all wanted to move forward. And, uh, you know, the last album was so well received it's it's given us all a, a boost of confidence and uh, we're getting more offers and, and better offers so uh it's it's good at the moment it's uh, it's very positive it's working well the new singer rasmus has, has been a real uh you know godsend for the band you seem to be a fairly prolific writer. I know when you went in the studio for the first time way back in the beginning that you had something like a, a hundred songs or riffs already right. in on the you know on the books, and then you brought forty five along when you went to do the new album. What keeps yeah. you uh, working so creatively? I guess I like to uh, you know when I practice, I, I very often come up with a riff or. A, a section or something and I would just keep recording things and uh, so I build up this backlog of, of ideas so that when we, we're we ready to record or an opportunity arises I've got stuff ready I've got material uh, you know in a demo form and I w I'm able to present it to uh, whoever's going to sing and then we can just whittle it down I'd rather have too many ideas than not enough and then the uh, you know, the quality control is higher and we can say this one and not, and not that one, you know. And uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be, want to just write, say, ten songs and that's it. But, you know, I'll, to be fair, I probably had the luxury of having time to do that uh, rather than it's you've got three weeks and it's all a mad rush, you know, which some bands uh, end up doing. But, uh, yeah, I like to have uh, more than we need. You're latest album as you've already said was received pretty ecstatically by critics yeah. and fans uh yeah. which has to be great for for you and the guys a lot of people say that they feel that it it harkens back to your earliest sound was that intentional yeah. um kind of we we had a brief when we were writing we said it should sound like diamond head uh so that that uh made us uh, able to throw out anything that that didn't kind of you know sound like diamond head so if somebody came up with an idea and we just thought mm, it don't really fit our brief you could you could throw it out without upsetting somebody and and then wanting to, to do their song or their idea because the overriding thing is diamond head has a sound and has a style and the, especially the first three albums uh Lightning to the Nations in particular seem to be what the Diamondhead fan wants. Uh, so we we kind of thought let's you know let's see if we can write a kind of classic Diamondhead album and and uh, eject things that are maybe too heavy or too too modern too prog. You know, uh, it's quite easy to go down a, the wrong route. You know, when you're experimenting and trying to find something new, but. Uh, by being, you know, by being a bit careful and and uh, uh, listening to the to the the demos and then to the rehearsal tapes and all that, you could say, okay, that is very diamond head, that riff there, and this, you know, this chorus, and uh, so we kind of worked like that. And I think also Raz coming in new and fresh, he went over all the back catalogue 
And I think it could, almost with his producer's hat on, he was able to pick out what Diamond Head is, what is great about Diamond Head, and, and what probably doesn't work about Diamond Head, where we've, we've tried a few uh, variations in the, over the years. And, uh, and he would just say, that is so Diamond Head, you know, or this, we should do something a bit like this. So, you know, kind, it's kind of uh, planned out, but... It's very difficult to write another Am I Evil or another song like The Prince or Help Us or something. So it's not as easy as it sounds, but all you can do is kind of try and uh, uh, filter. Keep it in the back of your mind the whole time that you're recording. Yeah, yeah. You were originally going to release this one independently again. Uh, How did you hook up eventually with uh, Dissonance? Uh, I think it was a case of our agent... uh, got in touch and, and just said, you know, we've got a new album. And, uh, uh, yeah, we initially, uh, we, we pressed up a thousand copies and uh, I, I started doing press and we, was, we sent them out to the press in January of 2016. And instantly the feedback we were getting was really positive. And that possibly, you know, played into the hands of dissonance where they got involved and they probably thought, oh, yeah, you know, if Diamond has got a new album and, and it sounds like it's it's good, then uh, we'd like to get involved. I think they were probably looking for a band like Diamond Head and, and, and Catalog. Uh, so they, they just got on board, made us a good offer, and I was more than happy to, to, to go with uh, Steve Beattie and, and Dissonance. You know, it's been nine years between what's in your head and the current album. Mm. Uh, are we all going to have to wait another nine years for the no. next one? <laughs> no, you're not. You, we, we're working on it now. We've been doing it since January, really. Uh, so we've got a lot of good ideas. And we're planning to even like record the drums, uh, possibly July, So and then work on the rest of the, the stuff. Uh, a little later in the year because uh, uh, you know our drummer's over here for, for about eight weeks and we, we think we can get rehearsals going and, and probably get the drums down and while he's here and uh, so it, it's coming on it's coming on well we've got, we've got again we've got quite a bit of material we've got more than we need <laughs> uh, and, and you know it sounds good I, I'm sure it'll be another good album I'm quite confident you uh, just this past week, it was announced that Lars Ulrich has a new show on Beats One called yeah. "It's Electric," and yeah, great. Uh, you know, it, uh, obviously the the name comes from from your song, and I also understand yeah. that the uh, a bit of the song is used as as part of his theme music. That has to be right. uh, pretty amazing for for you folks. And uh, the question is, when's Lars going to have you on the show? I don't know. He he did call me, and he. Uh... He asked about that. He said, are you okay with this? I'm going to play the song at the beginning of each show, and the show's going to be called It's Electric. And I was, of course, yeah, of course, brilliant idea. <laughs> you know, what a great idea. Uh, but um, I may get, get another call at some point and say, you know, oh, do you want to do an interview or something? But I don't know yet. I think that they're planning it in blocks, and they, maybe they've got the first, few, you know, few worked out what they want to do. I know Iggy Pop did... did what the first one or something like that, um, but uh, this, you know I don't know yet. But I, it's possible that 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 may happen because he he's still a fan. Obviously, it's it's uh, it's been such a big help to the band. Uh, you've worked with a number of of great bands. You know, uh, is there anybody that you haven't had a chance to play with or work with over well, the years that you'd like to? Well, there's loads. I mean, my favourite band is Led Zeppelin, so, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to work with Robert Plant, wouldn't it, or somebody like that, you know, Jimmy Page. But it'd be a dream come true. I did get to work with Tony Iommi, though, and he's one of my heroes, so, the, you know, the master riff writer. So that, that, was, that was an a, amazing experience, uh, and we wrote a song together called Starcraft that we still play live, and, uh, you know, it's great. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, this, you know, I love ACDC. This, 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 I'm a fan. I'm a fan of rock and music. So there's tons of bands I admire. And, you know, if they, if they called me, I'd, I'd be there. Diamond Head's self-titled album is available now. 
The band will be touring Europe in June and July before returning to the United States in August. We'll be back next week with another edition of the VVN Music Podcast. Remember that you can hear the VVN Music Podcast via iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Libsyn, and the VVN Music website. For the latest news on the veteran artists of rock, pop, soul, country, folk, and blues, go to vvnmusic.com. If you have any comments or questions about the website or this podcast, please send them to vvnnetwork at gmail.com. Our theme music is performed by Yahar. This program was released on May 22, 2017. The VVN Music Podcast is a production of the VVN Network, copyright 2017.